Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, that's better. Now let's get started. And for those of you out on television, again, we just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. I guess you've heard that often enough. But I'm going to address a few things that keep coming in over the phone, over the line, and that is, do not... Please do not apologize, you folks out on television, for not being able to give a large offering. We appreciate your prayers as much as any cash that you could possibly give. So don't apologize if you're not in a position to give a lot. And always remember, it's the widow's might that uh, the Lord recognized. So that's the first thing. I had to write a few of these things down because I've been forgetting it. Again, we want to thank you, of course, for your letters. They continue to be such a an encouragement to us, my, when we realize what the Lord is doing. In fact, we got folks visiting us from Indiana. Where are you, uh, you guys? Yeah. And uh, Brenda said last night as we were sharing some of these things, she said, this is what we like to hear. This tells us that our money is accomplishing things. And uh, you bet it is. My goodness, in fact, I, I had a conversation yesterday with a couple of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, the lady has already come out, and uh, her husband's on the fence, so I had a nice conversation with him, and uh, that's what's going on. And uh, we're just reaching a lot of people from various backgrounds that are beginning to see the truth of these Pauline mysteries. All right, the other one is our prison ministry, and we haven't mentioned that as often, I suppose we should. For you fellows that are watching the program in prison, if you would like our transcribed books, we send them out free to any prison inmate that asks for them. And uh, we send them out three at a time, starting with number one. We set out one, two, and three. And when they're ready for four, five, and six, we send. So we've got a lot of, of these older fellows in prison who are already up at books 40, 50, 60. And uh, if any of you are out there uh, are interested, just Give us a note, drop, drop us a note, and we'll get that in the mail to you. Uh, the other one is newsletter. We have a quarterly newsletter that we send out free. And if you're not getting it and would like to, again, just call the girls and give them your name and address, and our newsletter will come. And I always emphasize there's no begging for money in our newsletter. <laughs> I won't ask for money on the program. I won't ask for it in the newsletter. So it'll be strictly some tidbits of some scriptures and uh, our itinerary and so forth. And then the other question that comes in so often, can I copy your material? Absolutely. Anybody can copy anything they want off the internet or from the books or from the tapes because, again, we're not in this for the money. We want to get the word out. And so if some of you out there want to make copies, you go right ahead and copy. All we ask is that they don't sell it for a profit. <laughs> That's the purpose for the being copyrighted. We have to be protected on that. But other than that, uh, if it's for the Lord's service, why, well, you go ahead and copy all you want. All right, I think that's enough for that. Let's get back into our mysteries now as we see them listed on the board. We've covered the mystery of his will, the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the body of Christ. And uh, we're having a question here in the studio whether we've actually done the, the uh, mystery of God in Colossians. I think we did. But... If not, we may have to get it later. But uh, for right now, I'm going to jump in at the mystery of godliness. And that is in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Now, while you're looking that up, I'm going to remind you again of our rule of thumb for Bible study. And what is it? Who wrote it? Well, this is the Apostle Paul. Who was he writing to? His young son in the faith, Timothy. And uh, so it's a letter that is preparing Timothy for picking up the mantle, as it were, if Paul leaves before the Lord comes. And I'm of the impression that all these early men of God were of the impression that the outcalling of the church would come in their lifetime. Now, not everybody's going to agree with that, but uh, they certainly didn't think it was going to be 2,000 years. That I know for sure. So anyway, Paul is writing to Timothy in preparation of his taking over his role as the apostle of the Gentiles or whatever. And so what he writes here, I think, makes all the difference in the world if you understand those circumstances. But let's come in at verse 
in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. We'll start at verse 14. These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, which in, well, let's just stop and show you what I'm talking about. Come back to Ephesians a moment, because we have to find these things out from Scripture, otherwise it's just the words of another human being. Come back to Ephesians chapter 1. And again, let's just jump in a few verses ahead of what I want. Verse 20. You got it? Ephesians 1, verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. In other words, to establish again who Christ really is. Now verse 22, And so God hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head, not the king, but the head over all things to the church which is his body. Now you see, most of Christendom can't differentiate that. They think the church is the church and the church. In fact, those of you who were with me last week, you saw that evidence. But listen, there are all kinds of churches listed in Scripture. And in my experience last week, that's what I tried to do. The word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, always. Well, good heavens, when uh, Stephen writes in Acts chapter 7 about the church in the wilderness, he wasn't talking about a New Testament church. He was talking about Israel having called out of Egypt and assembled around Mount Sinai. But he was called an ecclesia. But the translators called it the church in the wilderness. Well, you have several of those things. But you always have to differentiate which church is Scripture talking about. See, and they can't handle that. No, 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 no. I can still hear them, see. But this is what we're talking about. The church, which is his body, and it's the fullness or the complement of him that fulleth all in all. Now, I'm going to make the point later today, and I'll make it again next taping, and maybe the next one. And that is that this body of Christ's church is never, ever alluded to or hinted at or spoken of anywhere else in your Bible except Paul's epistles. You cannot find it. It's not addressed anywhere, see? And so these things make all the difference in the world. So now if you come back to 1 Timothy with me a minute, to chapter 3, now verse 16, that without controversy, great is the mystery, there's that word, great is the secret of godliness, and here it is. This is the secret that God was manifest in the flesh, justified by the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, beginning, of course, with Paul's apostleship, believed on in the world as a result of the preaching of the gospel, and then received up into glory. Of course, he's at the Father's right hand. But you see, all of these things were still in an untold mode until it comes out in this apostle's epistles. And that's why he's always referring to these things as mysteries, secrets. See? And again, you know the verse in Deuteronomy, and I hope most of my television audience already knows it. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Why? He's sovereign. He can do what he wants. And if he doesn't want the human race to know something, he doesn't have to tell us. But the verse goes on to say, the things that are revealed belong to us. Well, it's the same situation that I, uh, I use in Romans chapter 10, that faith cometh by hearing. And hearing comes how? By the word of God. 
And I'm always asking the question, can you believe something that God hasn't said? No way. So we have to wait until God says it as a revelation from the uh, ascended glory now before we can believe it. And that again is what people can't comprehend. And that's why Paul is constantly referring to all these mysteries. These were all doctrinal truths that were never addressed anywhere else in Scripture. God kept them secret for his own purposes, see? And that's why there's so much confusion. That's why there is blenderizing all the time, see? All right, so let's just look back at verse 16 once again. So without contrary, without any room for argument, great is this mystery, this revealed secret now of godliness, not according to Israel's law, not according to being forced to do things in, in response to their religion, but under this whole system of grace, it becomes an automatic, see? And this Lord Jesus, who has made all this possible, was seen of angels, of course he was. He was preached to the Gentiles. Now, let me just make a point here again. Come back to Ephesians once more. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Just, just for an example, so that you know where we're coming from. Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now again, you've got to ask yourself, well, where is he writing? Well, in prison, in Rome. And he's writing to Gentiles. And so this is why he can say, by the inspiration of the Spirit, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentile, see how specific this is? All right, come back again then to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, received up into glory. Well, what's that a reference to? Well, his ascensions, but before he ascended, he was seen of not only the 12, but of 500 others. And then Paul says, and last of all, he was seen of me also, see? And then, of course, he went on up into the glory to take that position at the right hand of the Father. All right, now I think there's another scripture that we can refer to in this same light, and that would be in Titus. Titus, chapter 2. Titus, chapter 2. Drop down to verse 11. Titus, chapter 2. Verse 11, still from the pen of the Apostle Paul, writing again to one of his other associates, who I think he refers to in uh, one of his passages as fellow uh, apostles and prophets. All right, now he's writing to Titus. Chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has, past tense, appeared unto all men, in other words, it wasn't just confined to the few. And here it is, verse 12. This is what the grace of God coming through the word of God is now doing for you and I as Gentiles. It's teaching us that denying ungodliness, denying worldly lusts or desires, we live soberly. In other words, not frivolously. Righteously. In other words, we are always attaining to do that which is right before God as well as before men. And godly. Now that's a small g. And that again means the very opposite of living according to the God of this world. We live according to the dictates and the teachings of the Word of God. All right, in this present world, see, as we live from day to day, Monday through Saturday, not just on Sunday morning, for most people, that's the only hour they practice their faith. But it's a seven-day-a-week responsibility, see, in this present world. And then at the same time, while we're living and walking the Christian life, what are we also to be doing? We're to be looking, expecting that blessed hope, as we're going to see later this afternoon, if not 
This time it'll be the next taping, which so many in the world today are scornfully ridiculing. But for you and I who believe, it's the blessed hope. Don't you ever forget it. And what is it? The glorious appearing, and it's not the second coming. This is the appearing for the body of Christ because that's who Paul is constantly associated with. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, now all of that, I think, is what Paul had reference to when he wrote in 1 Timothy that the mystery of godliness is the fact that believers can live a godly lifestyle. It's not impossible. Now, for Israel under the law, it was just about an impossibility, see? But now again, let me just use Scripture as an example of how the believer is to walk in this age of grace. And I think it fits perfectly with what he just said in Titus. Go back with me to Galatians chapter 5. And I use this several times a week in my phone calls or letters to the listening audience. Galatians chapter 5. Let's just start at verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then. Now remember, Paul is writing to Gentile believers, not the nation of Israel. He's writing to Gentile believers. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, see, and you will not fulfill or give in to the lust or the desires of the flesh. See that? For the flesh, the old Adam, the old nature, the lost world around us. The flesh lusteth or warreth against the spirit life. The spirit or the spirit life now wars against the flesh that is in the life of a believer. We have these two entities within us, the old Adam and the new spirit life, and they're in a constant warfare. And these are contrary one to the other, absolutely, as opposite as daylight from dark, so that you cannot do the things you would. Now, you've heard me use this before. That's sort of like floating in a canoe on a swift flowing river. If you're going to just float, which way do you go? Well, back, see? In order to make headway, you're going to have to constantly put effort into the paddle and to take that canoe upstream. That's the Christian life. You can't just sit back in your easy chair and say, well, I'm living the Christian life. No, you're not. You're being lazy and you're inept and you're accomplishing nothing. And so we have to be out there going against the stream. All right, now then verse 18. But if you're led of the Spirit, see now this is the mystery of godliness. You know, you got to remember, Israel didn't have this, did they? Israel didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit to help them keep the law. All they had was that heavy, thou shalt, thou shalt not. But see, we don't have any of that. That's been set aside, and in place, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. All right, so here it is. If you're a believer, and the indwelling Holy Spirit is now leading you, you don't need the law. You don't have to have the law tell you what's right and what's wrong. All right, now then, in order to define it clearly so that there's no doubt as to what you and I as believers should be avoiding, here they are, the works of the flesh. And it's not pretty. You know, you've heard me do this before. As we go through these things now, ask yourself, would I like to live in a community that is based on this lifestyle? Is this where I would like to live? Well, let's look at it. The works of the flesh are adultery. What brings in more pain and more heartache and more upheaval in the home than adultery? It never brings joy and happiness. We see it in the world all the time. Would you like to live in the midst of that? No, no way. Fornication. Well, that's just the next step down from adultery. 
In fact, I had a lady write just the other day. She was shocked at Webster's definition of fornication. She thought that that was just a vile, vile, vile sexual act. No, fornication, according to Webster, is sexual relationships between any two people who are not husband and wife. That covers the whole gamut, see? And look at the world today. They're wallowing in it. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Now, that's just another fancy word for just constantly living in the gutter level. Idolatry. Now, you go back into Israel's history, idolatry was actually compared to what? Adultery. Why? Because idolatry is spiritual adultery. Now, I got you thinking. I can tell we're looking at you. <laughs> How do I come to that conclusion? Well, you see, Israel had the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Under the law, with all of its stipulations. Now then, when an Israelite would go and bow down to an idol, he was now entering into a spiritual relationship with somebody other than who he belonged to. And when you do that, what have you got? Adultery. See? So spiritual adultery is just as much an anathema to God as physical adultery. And always remember that. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. Boy, I taught you something today, didn't I? <laughs> Witchcraft. Now, we like to think in America we're not plagued with that. Are you kidding? It's popping up all over the country. On the East Coast, they tell me it's just unbelievable the amount of young people that are getting involved in witchcraft. In fact, she and I had a first-hand experience. We were, we were uh, taken into a women's prison. And before we got there, one of the ladies that was going to take us in said, now, remember, Les, we were talking about witchcraft last night out here, and you're going to bump right into it when we get into this group of ladies. Well, I know Iris and I both thought she was kind of stretching the envelope. But you know what? We hadn't been in there. They had about 20 young ladies. We hadn't been in there five minutes, and up came witchcraft. Unbelievable. And so there it is. And it's one of the things of the things of the flesh, see? All right, time's going fast. Oh, where was I? Hatred. Hatred. What's the opposite of hatred? Love, see? Would you like to live in a community where there's no love ever expressed? That your neighbors hated you and you hated your neighbors? That'd be a horrible lifestyle. But that's the world, see? Next word. Emulations, variance, wrath, strife. Never, never a calm minute. It's always a community in uproar. Sedition which is really a rebellion against governmental authority. Heresies, see? Can't believe a thing you hear. Envyings. Murder. My, we're seeing that, aren't we? Drunkenness, which a lot of times leads to murder. Revelings, which leads to drunkenness. Such like. The which I tell you before, I have told you in times past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These people are not going to be there. And they may be good church members. They may think they're okay. But if this is their lifestyle, there's no evidence that God has ever entered into their life. None whatsoever. But now you go into verse 22, and I guess we can finish the half hour. This is the other side of the coin. This is the life of the spirit-indwelt believer. And he may not necessarily be the most spiritual, because that's a process, you know. We don't all get spiritual overnight. But for the believer, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, this is the result. The first word is what? Love. Love, which is the very benchmark of all of true Christianity. It was the love of God that put Christ on the cross, see? It was the love of God that caused old Saul of Tarsus to suffer for 20-some years to get this glorious message into the Gentile world. Love is the key. You've heard that before. All right, the next one is joy. 
My, what a difference between joy and happiness. See, joy is that which Paul had in the dungeon. Miserable. His back probably still healing from beatings. Cold and wet. And yet, what could Paul exclaim? Rejoice. See? They could sing hymns in the midst of it all. Now, happiness, that's a shallow thing. Happiness is something when everything is going your way. The stock market's going up. Your health is good. Your bills are paid. You're secure in your job. You got a good wife. You got good kids. That all builds what? Happiness. But what does it take to dump it? Any little accident. And happiness just goes out the window. But joy, joy is eternal, beloved. You know, that's why I love mountains. I just love mountains because they are so eternal. They are so eternal. Well, that's joy, see? That is an eternal uh, result of our faith. All right, let's get a couple more. Peace. Now, when Paul speaks of peace, he speaks of two kinds of peace. The peace with God, which we experienced the moment we were saved. And then we have the peace of God, which carries us in our daily life. That come what may, we have the peace of God that is carrying us through. All right, got to go a little quickly. Long-suffering, that gives us patience, gentleness. Sometimes, you know, I know I myself, I get prone to be tempted to lose that gentleness, but uh, I pray constantly, Lord, keep me gentle, keep me kind. Faith, meekness, temperance. Now, there's a word that too many people can find merely to being temperate with your alcohol in, in, uh, intake. No, temperance is something that carries into every facet of life. How you raise your children, under a heavy hand of the whip, under the loose hand of permissiveness, neither one are going to work. But when you're temperate, you're what? You're in a balance. In everything, we are to be temperate. We maintain a balance, and we don't go head over heels one way or the other. And then against all these things, Paul says, there is no law. There is nothing that would forbid any of these fruits of the Spirit to be functional in the life of the believer. And all it takes is being submissive to the leading and the guiding of our precious Holy Spirit. And we do that, of course, through an attitude of prayer. Lord, give me wisdom. Lead me. Direct me day by day. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.